Good evening, everyone. I'd like to formally open tonight's ceremony slash presentation. My name is Kilolo Brody, and I'm the department chair uh, of social work and the MSW program director. Uh, however, for tonight, the hat that I'm wearing is the chair of the President's Commission on Diversity and Inclusion, which was formerly known as the Affirmative Action and Diversity Committee. On behalf of the Department of History and on behalf of the Dean of the College of the Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, this is a collaborative joint effort and I just want to say we sincerely appreciate your attendance tonight. I welcome you and thank you for being present. So, we have quite a lineup for you tonight. So I think for the last maybe three or four years, um, history, the College of uh, the Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, uh, we have gotten together to put on some type of Black History Month event or program. And each year it looks a little bit different. So this year we've got song, we've got music, we've got dance, we've got lecture, we've got interaction. So I'm hoping that you will enjoy it because we immensely enjoyed putting together the lineup for you tonight. I uh, would like to start by sharing with you some of the background in terms of why celebrating this event during the month of February is so important to me. At a previous institution where I taught, I asked my students to tell me about Jim Crow. What did they know about Jim Crow? The classroom fell silent. I'm looking around the room and finally someone was brave enough to say, I don't remember reading about him. And then someone else echoed, I'm not sure who he is. And that gave me immense pause. And I said, hmm, that is one of the reasons why I will always see purpose in recognizing Black History Month. Jim Crow was not a he. It was more of a thing or an it uh, with no positive connotations associated with it. But again, this was in a master's level program and it was just, I thought, a general question. It was, the class was race, gender, and inequality. Um, and so that was kind of like saying to me, I need to back it up just a little bit from where the starting point is. So anyway, um, I don't take for granted that the knowledge and the history and the rich legacy is just apparent to everyone, even for African Americans. <clears throat> As an African-American woman, I have the accomplishments of trailblazers who would not rest, the souls of brave pioneers who preceded me, many of whom traveled by way of the Middle Passage. Their spirits lift me up, and so I lift. Let's press onward in unison this evening as we celebrate Black History Month at Stan State. We are going to open tonight's program with the singing of the Black National Anthem or the Negro National Anthem. So I'm gonna give a little bit of history about why that's our opener. Dr. Carter G. Woodson was an African-American historian, author, and scholar who completed his PhD in history at Harvard University in 1912 making him the second African-American to earn a doctorate from Harvard. Does anyone know who the first African-American uh, to earn a doctorate degree from Harvard University was? Come on, don't let me down. Take your phone out, Google it, come on. First African-American to earn a PhD from Harvard University. Thank you, W.E.B. Du Bois. Carter G. Woodson continued to teach and later joined the faculty at my alma mater, one of my alma maters, Howard University in Washington, D.C. Dr. Woodson worked and worked to preserve the history of African Americans and accumulated a collection of thousands of artifacts and publications. His purpose in doing so was to ensure that the ancestry and lineage of Africans 
and people of African descent would not be overlooked, ignored, or suppressed. In 1926, Dr. Carter G. Woodson founded Negro History Week, which was the second week of February, and that was deliberate, being that it fell in between the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. In 1976, the celebration of Negro History Week expanded to include the entire month. Ooh, we can a whole month. In a moment, we will join in a musical selection, lift every voice and sing, often called the Black National Anthem, which was written as a poem in 1899 by James Weldon Johnson, and then set to music by his brother, John Rosamond Johnson. It was first performed in a Jacksonville, Florida public school where James Weldon Johnson was the principal. And in 1919, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, adopted the song, Lift Every Voice and Sing as its national anthem. I'd like to introduce to you our vocalist for the evening, Ms. Karen Ridley, who is a native of Stockton, California. Any Stocktonians in the house? All right. She is a talented educator and administrator who just so happens to be gifted to sing anything from gospel to jazz. Her parents noticed a special gift in her about the age of one when she would sing herself to sleep. You know, most babies, someone else sings, to, she would sing herself to sleep. Her roots come from a long line of talented gospel singers and musicians from both sides of her family. She has participated in clubs in Hollywood, but mostly enjoys singing and ministering as a praise and worship leader. Her voice continues to reach many as she leads people into praise and worship each Sunday. She claims to be shy in nature, but once she hits a note, her soul from deep within shines brightly for all who are listening. I know Karen on a personal level, we were both students here in the 1990s, and she is one of my sorority sisters. She is accompanied by Charles, wait a minute, Charles Ware Jr., that's what I was thinking. And so he's going to accompany her by playing the piano. If you could please give a warm round welcome for Charles and Karen. I just have to say that was a beautiful introduction. Thank you. Had to 
trying to get myself together, but uh, I love her voice, and I used to uh, try to do anything I could to get her to sing so I could hear that beautiful, melodic voice. Thank you again so much, Karen and Charles, and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs> all right, next up, we have an African dance company performing, led by Kimya Mitrani. What they are going to do is share a little bit about what it is they're going to perform and why, give a little bit of context and history, and then I'll let you just enjoy the rest. So if I could have you give a warm welcome for the souls of the rising sun. Test. Testing one, two. Hi, how's everybody? Hello! Hello! Hello, Fia! Well, we're gonna, we welcome, and it's an honor to be here. Wonderful, beautiful campus. And um, we're gonna start with a welcome song. And you're welcome to join in. It's a simple song called Funga Alafia. Funga Alafia, can you say that? Funga Alafia. Yeah, and it goes just like that. <clears throat> so we'll let. Thank you. 
celebrate with you and bring a, a really happy feeling to you, yeah? So um, I might come out there and get one of you to come dance up here with me, see? <laughs> so if you're not smiling, I will come grab you. <laughs> so we're going to, um, we're going to go into now more of a traditional piece it's a, uh, from the traditional of uh, the folk tradition, and it's what we call our sacred song and dance from Nigeria. And this piece is of Onorisha, of the traditional sacred spiritual system, and it is of Oshun. So you'll hear us sing of Oshun. Oshun is the mother of the river. And so she represents a big part in Nigeria of the Yoruba tradition. And she um, basically constitutes for health, for justice, for liberty, for love, for beauty, and for sweetness. Um, her ideal of dealing with conflict and things around the world is to deal with it with peace and sweetness, but yet she holds firm with uh, liberty and justice for all, yeah? Oshun. Thank you. 
That's Oshun, mother of the river that blesses everybody, that blesses all with her pure existence. Without water, we know we could not live. So water makes everything existence in our worlds. And we're no different and less without it, right? So with that said, we're going to attribute this next one called Obatala. Can everybody say Obatala? Obatala is a koro. We call them koros because koro means song. Koro for our elders. Obatala is the elder in the village that keeps the wisdom, that keeps us on the straight path with the wisdom that they behold us through their life, through their teachings, and through their journey and walk. They share to us and keep us on a straight path, a tribute to our elders, Obatala. Thank you. 
Stockton area and Modesto. To my right, Ricky. Come back. <laughs> to my right is Dante Ramirez. He has been a student of mine since eight years old. Give him a hand. Ashe. Eight years old out of the housing projects of Stockton, California. 
to my side learning the traditions of Africa. To his right, Ricky Latour, give him a hand, from Modesto. A long time musician of Stockton, of Modesto area, and he has a group called Cradle of Sound, who his wife and him record together. And I just heard they got a touring contract to go to France. Give it up. And to his right, we have Eric Dosh, a student from Delta Community College in the sociology department. Give him a hand. We thank you so much. It's an honor having us and enjoy the rest of the show. Hello. Thank you, souls of the rising sun. Well, the whole time I couldn't stop moving. Uh, I don't know where you went, but I traveled to Latin America. I traveled to the Caribbean. I traveled to the shores of Africa. I traveled to urban inner cities, but I visited many indigenous lands on that journey we just had with them. And I'm hoping it was as enjoyable, for you, as enjoyable for you as it was for me. I think I saw my salsa dance partner. Uh-huh. We, we used to go salsa dancing on Thursday night, so <laughs> this should make up for it, because we could do many of those moves right here on the aisle way. All right, I'd like to um, uh, introduce our president who is here joining us, President Ellen Jun, and I would ask that she please come up, say a few remarks before we introduce Mr. Kinara Sankofa. Welcome our president. Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to see so many people here tonight, and because this is a very special performance and event as you have experienced so far, I'm sorry I had to join you a little bit later, but I uh, wanted to give special thanks to those who have helped to organize this uh, wonderful event, uh, Dr. Kila Labrodi and of course, uh, Dean Jim Tewadio. Jim is here, there's Jim. So a special shout out to both of them. Um, as president for this campus, the new president, I came in July, one of the most important things, one of the most important things is to really reaffirm, celebrate, and recognize the tremendous diversity that we have here on campus and in our community. And obviously African American students, <coughs> excuse me, and the community here is, is very, very important to Turlock and to our region. And uh, so I'm very proud to know, to say that we have uh, students on campus who are about, about the same percentage here on campus as they are in the, the uh, surrounding community. And we want to make sure that we're going to have more events and organizations that will focus on all the different ethnic groups. And one of the things that I was surprised to, to find out <clears throat> about this campus is that we probably could benefit by having more student clubs that focus on different ethnic groups, <clears throat> whether it's African American or Latino or Asian. And then on, in addition, I would love to see more organizations pop up for um, faculty and staff. Many campuses have an Asian faculty and staff association, a black faculty and staff association, a Hispanic or Latino uh, faculty and staff. So in the coming uh, months and years, I hope that we'll see more of that to come. And so one of the things that I have um, commissioned is a new commission called the Presence Commission for Diversity and Inclusion. And uh, the really fun thing about this is that the new uh, chair of that important commission will be our very own Dr. Kilila Brody. So a shout out to Dr. Kilila. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very big committee. It's sort of a, a, a modification of what was called the Affirmative Action Committee, but I'm enlarging the scope and the visibility and the charge to the committee. So this committee will be in the next year uh, developing an institutional plan for diversity and inclusion that will look at everything from not just hosting more events, because I have had students come and say, you know, I wish there were more events that spoke to me and my group, my affinity group, whether it's LBGQT, whether it's um, religious, faith-based, whether it's ethnic, that we need to have more of that. And not just celebrate, for example, different groups once a year, like 
African American History Month is in February. Why not do it all year round? That we ought to have be celebrating and integrating that into everything we do, not just in terms of social and community building events, but also looking at our curriculum. So as I said, <clears throat> the commission that uh, Kilolo will chair will look at, <clears throat> excuse me, if we, if our curriculum, if the courses that we have students take here accurately reflect all of the different um, social, political, cultural groups that um, are what make America so great. So we want to integrate that, as well as talk about campus climate, um, faculty and staff hiring, right? So we want to have a, a very comprehensive approach to ensuring that all aspects of the university life is is reflective of the strength and the diversity we have in our student body and in our region. So that's something that we're really going to look forward to. And I can say that, that um, <clears throat> Chancellor's Office also has something they call Super Sundays. And Super Sundays is an event that they do in February where every president uh, goes out to at least two African American churches. So they call them Super Sunday. So last Sunday and the Sunday before, I went to two African American churches located in Stockton and uh, got the word out about how we want to encourage and foster and have more and more students from, from all different groups come to, to Stan State and get a baccalaureate degree or a master's degree or even a doctorate. So we want to spread that word. So that's going out. Uh, we've been doing that. So all together, 23 presidents, I believe I was told, uh, reached um, over, let's see, 100 churches throughout the state of California and are getting the message out to have more, uh, more students come and become uh, warriors. So that's a, a very wonderful thing to see happening. So again, I just want to say uh, thank you for coming. We hope to have more of these events in the future and uh, really keep the strength and think about starting one of those. If you're a student, why don't you start an organization that reflects your, kept, your cultural or identity group and then sponsor, we can work together to have more funding so that you can access funding to uh, do you know, workshops, seminars, uh, social activities as well. So together I know we can build an even stronger, more inclusive, uh, campus, community, and experience for all of us. So thank you again for being here, and I know you're going to have a wonderful rest of the show. Thank you. All right, we have a spoken word artist coming up next. And it's interesting, but I feel like I've known this person for a long time, but I just met him tonight. But in the communication that we've had over the last couple of months, I really feel like I know a bit about who he is. So I'll give you a brief background. Um, I don't want to spoil too much for you, but I just want you to know the person who will be engaging with us next is a poet, an author, keynote speaker, a lecturer, an activist, clothing designer, a production manager. He's lived uh, and visited Sydney, Australia. He is an individual who speaks about unjust wars, politics, resolutions, overcrowded hospitals, closure of schools, those kind of things that really impact many of us and many of our family members, especially in our current climate in 2017. So without further ado, I would like to ask that we give a warm stand state welcome to Mr. Kinara Sankofa. How y'all doing tonight? Come on now, come on. How y'all doing tonight? Now you gotta be feeling good. Before I uh, get started, I want to do an old traditional thing that we did back home, back home in Kimmen or Africa, and we recognize our elders before we spoke. When I was growing up, you couldn't just come out into the living room and have a party with your family. You had to get permission. So I asked my elder to give permission to continue on with the show. Thank you. It's been a long time coming. Days in and days out, I keep on wondering, when are we going to come together? You see, it's cool how chameleons were taught to hate each other in our tribe. Truthfully, it was well over two years since I last talked to one of my brothers of blood, bones, and sweat. Yet I speak to thee to let some of these words of mine flex your mind. 
You see, my time from birth on this earth have shown me some things. Uh, allow me to give you a bit while we are getting tossed and turned and been on ghetto lines. See, my poems, they got to be strong. Not unlike the den on the mental set in place long ago by Willie Lynch. Ism letter was a lie. Now it's time to rise like the first resurrected Christ. Proper name is our song. They say Osiris, his sister and wife, gave birth to a son named Haru. Haru's mother's name is Aset. The Greeks say Isis, in case you didn't or you don't know. Look, I speak about those who rose from the east, so when I step to any mic, the speaker's got to be deep like the depths of that tsunami. For one moment, please listen and follow, which brings me another topic. Let me ask you. Is it possible that tsunami they were blaming on Mother Nature? It was an underground rocket. I mean, atomic bomb, test your mind, check. Boom! That's how the matrix of the Illuminati's flex. I come to learn and witness there's only 300 powerful men ruling the world. I got five on it. Now place your bed and rise and come and witness the PC. If you get up early enough in the morning, you sit, you wait, you watch the sun should rise and come where from the east. Is that not prophecy? Look, I make no claims to being a prophet. But I got this one down to a T. See, I dotted my eyes. Now take your time slowly before you think and blink. Because see, by the time the ink dries to the paper, which equals flow, now you know. I'm sitting with memories, reciting lines, sipping on hot cocoa and eating toast. From my seat, I'm going to rise. My favorite hero is El Haj Malik El Shabazz. To the United States, <clears throat> excuse me, states, he was considered a threat. One day they got a regret. Brothers like Mumia, Abu, Jamal, we should never, ever forget. Look, my anger will never again be suppressed or compressed. I'm going to tell it like it is from the north back to the south, to the east, and to the west. Me, Wazungu, knows that what I do, you do not want to test. Look, we may die, but we also multiply. You see, I'm from that same tribe over yonder, and I'm really trying to be a serious comedian. See, I'm proud of my heritage, bro. Remember, we were forced to live in these KKKs of the Americas. I'm telling you, a moment ago, I referred Osiris as the first resurrected Christ. Let me show you what I'm working with. Look, we don't have to believe the thievery of the Europeans because every word has an etymology. I'm not asking you to follow me. You be within your own rights to say this only my ideology. But what I say next, I make no apology. They stole us, even our own sold us into slavery. See, Osiris is the Corpus Christi, peeps. Listen up, the word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, spelled K to the R-I-S-T-O-S. And it means anointed. And Kemet, or what the Greeks call Egypt, K-R-S-T, Christ or Christ, means to bomb, to bomb or to make nummification. Hold up, wait a minute. From what we've been taught in Christian theology, he rose, he got up, he walked. See, but the thief cometh, but not for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they may have life and that they may have life abundantly. So don't want your mouse with me. See that four-letter word I just used? It's not my language. I say we have to rise. How y'all feeling out there? Y'all okay? Can we go deeper? Can we get a little deeper? All right. You hated me, and you still hate me. And I'm still black. You sold me into slavery, and I'm still black. You kill me innocently, yet, but non-innocently, and I'm still black. Racist cops keep shooting me in the back. You even raped my ancestors, male, female, as well as the child. You told me then, forget about that, and start now. But guess what? I'm still black. You say black is bad, and I'm still black. You say white is without evil intent, and I'm still black. You created AIDS. You sent it to Africa, and then back here to around the world, and I'm still black. And if you don't like this piece of poverty, I'm okay with that. You say, go back to Africa, don't you realize they black fool, and when you die, you're going to be black too, brother, man, sister, woman. Is it even within you to tell the truth? You came from me. I'm the beginning of the universe that's black. I'm the first, yep, the light and the white, which came out of black. Did you understand that? I'm the first black the light and the white which came out of black. Before there was any history, it was our story. And it was black. Say the word black. Did you say the word black? Did you say the word black? You got it. Before there was any history, it was our story. And it was black. See, you have created some 
black, white people too. Every being deserves to live on earth without you wanting to control everything. Your mind is wired like this. If I can't control it, then I should just ruin it. You think of terms like mine, 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 it's mine. Give it to me, it's mine, mine, mine. And when you cannot have it, you cannot own it, you whine, whine, whine. So how about this? If you go back to the beginning of time, to your original roots, you look deep enough, you'll find that you're black too. Remember, when you kill me, Mother Earth, my art, truth, justice, and righteousness, shh, shh, hush, little baby, you're killing yourself for eternal life. Thank you. Thank you. That's out of my book, card. Thank you. I want to write a poem that speaks truth. And regardless of what you think you know, and irrespective of what I let you in on, there are some things that must be said. As I've laid my head down to rest on pent-up thoughts, even though at times emotion seems lost, trapped inside like unstained clean glass, needed to be washed around old timber wooden window frames supported by cracked chip dried up paint, I want to write a poem. With softly pressed keyboard computer strokes, similar to the strokes of piano black and white notes, followed by analytical vibrations, taste and logical thoughts after the left hemisphere that's this thing to balance out the right side of brain waves. I want to write a poem that'll take you way black. I mean, so far back to when I could remember the smell of ethyl gasoline prices and petrol was 17 cents a gallon. And along that same time, my Uncle Walter had a three-speed green GTO. And life seemed easier back then than it is nowadays. Now, check this in because some things you might want to check out. You know, like when afros and pigs were in the mix, do you remember the one with the John Carlos and Tommy Smith black power fist that picked up with those ideal genails now called kitchen naps and kinks? Because finally, hot press and combs have pressed out that natural strength. See, I want to write a poem one day that will express the deep hidden vibe. You know, like the broken pride of a man who in the depth of his darkness alone he cries as his cheekbone meets salty dry tears, although he tries not to show his fears, Mr. Macho won't let it go. Because it's larger than life, that's his ego. I want to write a poem while laying down liquid ink between horizontal lines, filling up no longer white spaces, chasing sketches of past thoughts borrowed from adrenaline running through my veins as it reaches my fingertips. I want it to make complete and perfect sense. By the time the phonics hits your inner earlobe, connected to earwax, now melted because the canal which travels down to your throat has a clear patches of heat from these brown lips, speech to seek membranes like mouse mad, easy rollers, nervous. Like the five percenters should make you sit up and take notice of nationwide homicides and militias like in a Walter Mosley fictitious but actual factual thriller. I want to write a poem where the masses or the asses will boycott the mass killers of wars conducted in Africa, Libya, Afghanistan, Iraq while stealing natural resources of diamonds, golds, minerals, and oils. Here we go. All power to the people and not just to white supremacy. Really, it's inferiority. Have I now got your attention? You see, the media continues to lie and brain dead people continue to believe the hype. Like, for example, hmm. Saddam Hussein was supposed to have had weapons of mass destruction. I want to write a poem where you'll understand the uses of the term cracker and its origin. You see, it came way back black when Europeans were beating the crap by the men, women, and children with sticks and whips that made the sound of crack. Or when that cracker man cracked you upside your head with that black. Billy Club, and when Billy Club ancestral stolen generations of warriors and warettes, quarries of native homelands once roamed their homeland by the millions. Now they're down to one to two percent of the total population. Don't slip. See, I would never let you forget about the history or the her story. See, but you want me to forget. Some of my own people don't even want me to talk about it, tell me that that pain happened too long ago and that I got the same rights as anybody else. It's a shame how these politicians be straight out poly tricking and poly pimping the nation on illegal made up wars and bailing out the banks. Tell me, why does the bank need any help? Interest rates continue to rise. Tell me why is gas still so high? And it keeps going up, yet the average worker's wages continues to deteriorate. See, I really want
want to write a poem. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all okay? Y'all all right? Can we go a little deeper? All right, we're going to go like this. Um, has the world gone completely mad? Has the greatest creation of all species lost its way? Today I say humanity, it is up to us, the human race, to look deep from within the souls of your very being and stand up. I say stand up and shout with every breath that you can muster. I refuse to sit back and just occupy space, breathe, eat, defecate, and die. Oh yes, why my soul cries out for freedom of these beasts. It's up to every color and every creed to do what's right. I picked up paper and pen to write the facts because I'm tired of these so-called fat cats and capitalism with their propaganda lying lynching machines and racism uh, and smothering Mother Earth. You see, it hurts my soul to walk down the street, see no people with no shoes on their feet. Concrete is where they sleep with no food to eat. And every day, thousands upon thousands of people pretend they don't see the ridiculousness of the homelessness and the hopelessness. And if I dare turn on my television, which tells lies to your vision, I'd be even more numbed out to the dumbness of the so-called reality shows that only show more and more and more crap. Here's an example of the direct-to-consumer advertisement. The true minority is playing with people's happiness with infomercials telling me that I'm out of control with a mental disease this, or a mental disorder that. Simply wanted to control every aspect of your very being through the DSM-5. The Diagnostic Statistical Manual on Mental Health, collaborating with the FTC, the FDA, the FCC, the pharmaceutical industry. Yes, see, psychiatry is an industry of death. And the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, is strictly pushing pills. And the government on Capitol Hill is only concerned with, guess what? Making more and more capital while our babies are being murdered with these psychotropic drugs causing suicide and people to kill each other. Am I my brother's keeper? Brace yourself because this poem, it's about to get deeper than Moses standing against the tide of the Red Sea. You know Martin Luther King Jr. had more than just a fighting soul. He had a fighting soul that exposed truth to lies and discrimination like J. Edgar Hoover had spies. The chapter to the room of El Haj Malik El Shabazz. You know him as Malcolm X. So ask yourself this question. Am I part of the solution? Or am I the problem? Thinking that I can't make a difference, listen, it takes a village to raise a child. Society and those who want to control it have gone completely buck wild. Now stop it because this is not some feeble-minded so-called hip-hop or rap, even though it's lyrical. See, my calling is equal stood in this spoken word game. I see you. I saw it in a documentary called Psychiatry is an Industry of Death and that Benjamin Rush was dubbed the master bleeder in the field of mental health. And he's enshrined on the seal of the APA. Man, that says a whole lot about how these killers of today get away with pushing side effect drugs across the counter into your living room TV screen because see, if you laugh too much, <laughs> you laugh too much, it's a mental disease. If you have too much pain in your heart from losing a loved one, it's a disorder. If you pee too much, guess what? We got a pill for that too. And the God within you forgot how to tap into your psyche just in case you didn't know the word psyche originated in Kemet, Africa, and it means soul. I behold truth and expose I and I to a higher state of consciousness. Does all of this make any sense to you as I get even more poetical? You see, my science is political words coming to my brain like a child should never have to know words like uh, special ed class. That's unethical. And see, humanity lets me know that I'm right on track. And it's 
way past the possibility that my vocabulary and its impeccability is making sure that the delivery is unmistakably my liability. Can you feel me? Because it's like this. Who taught the black man and woman to hate self? Malcolm X said it's the hate that hate produce. Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream, but we've only been experiencing an American nightmare. So I dare you to stand up and fight this beast. See, when I finish a poem like this, I might say something like, uh, I wish you nothing but love, freedom, truth, justice, and peace from brutality against people who look like me must cease. Because if you're thinking marching down the street is going to make these cop killers stop, I say you're sleeping on the game. My name is Sankofa, which means to go back and fetch your roots. Wisdom from learning from the past to better your future. When I meet 16 to 18 year olds, they tell me that they think they're losers, trapped inside of their regal brown and black skin. I tell them to stop tripping because they came from the first people on the planet. And sometimes some people that don't look like them can't stand it. So we have to have more humanity. 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 Thank you. Y'all okay? All right. I'm going to do one more piece for you all. Can I do one more piece? It's kind of like one of my favorites. Um, it's definitely needed. There's a reason why it's not happening. There's a cause and there's an effect. Trust and believe we're still living in a system and a society that is highly, highly Racist, there's a reason why that is happening. See, when you get rid of me, when you get rid of the male, and that has always been the case, is to rid of the black male, particularly here in America. But I've lived in Australia for 15 years before, and it happens there. It's a global situation, it's a global problem. We can fix it, but we have to come to some truth. A place without the comedic man, a world without fathers, affects the outcome of our children's growth. You see, we're needed not in prisons, but instead in our homes, in our schools, in our community. It is up to us. We must positively show them and teach the children not to be foolish. Equip them. See, our women can't do it all. Slavery, drugs, pistols in the hood was Europe's final call. Another one bites the dust, laid out, stretched out in a line of white chalk. See, that was the plot from the beginning. They never taught that we invented mathematics, science, and furthermore, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, the Greeks were not the first psychologists. It's a farce created by a group of lionologists. But we are gifted. Yet we were stolen and sold from Sudan to Egypt, worked from sun up to sundown, from can't see in the morning to can't see at night, broken backs just to see the tribe fall. Prisons equals plantations. Informed ones know that slavery has shifted now, ain't that right? No longer can we afford to be MPNIA. In simple terms, it means missing plus not in action. Look how our young children are acting. Instead of reading a book, they're hooked on flavor of love, BS shows, Game Boy, PlayStation videos, education is lacking. Too many of our sons are packing, calling themselves pimps, dogs, niggas, and bees. And 12 and 13 year old boys are screaming about how they mack and you know backwards, niggas spell sagging. It's like the mental pilot is on automatic destruction, is what some say. But we cannot start tomorrow or later, greater. We must be right now, right here today. See, a world without fathers, black fathers particularly, is a travesty. Have we become so desensitized, closed mouths and eyes that we cannot recognize or we refuse to realize the catastrophe of our condition globally? Look around sometimes. We need another thousand Malcolms to speak, another Mumia, Asata, Eddie Marble, or Khalid Muhammad speech. As a matter of fact, multiply that X to the fifth, no lift that power to the tenth, and then divide it into 360 degrees. Our children need academics. Our male face, they deserve to see in all sectors, and it's got to be. Teach them about Tulsa, Oklahoma. See, not too long ago, it was called Black Wall Street. Reach out and understand. Misrepresented, yeah, man, we got to change this stuff ourselves. Where are you, black man? Stand up, African seas and strands, descendants of the comedic land, and stop the violence. Mental genocide on the street. Another night, another fatherless child cries self to sleep. See, it's time to peep game. See, our ancestors, they've got to be 
turning over in their graves after all that they went through. See, it's crazy. See, fathers are the first men in a daughter's life. And part of your role as Baba depends on the type of wife that they'll make for our sons. Now, don't you think that our situation would have turned out different if little Africa back in Tulsa, Oklahoma was never leveled and burned down to the ground? Sounds of government air bomb blasts. Mothers screaming for their husband and children fleeing with their dad. See, the past has a lot to do with the now and the future. Don't believe the hype, and not every African dad is a loser. I would never buy into that. Greenwood, Archer, and Pine is where it all took place. Bend together and see where the Gap Band got its name. So listen to this song and message and dance. And even though Barack Obama was the president, we're still living in a society which is straight out racist, calculating just how many prisons to build, filled with us and done out of jealousy. What about our story? You see, history or his side of the story is seriously missing pages. They have stolen our legacy misplaced it, replaced it, and our children are being miseducated, purposely enslaving minds. I say, come back John Carlos and Tommy Smith. Y'all know who that is? With the Black Power side. Peace. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all okay? Thank you. Thank you, Kanara. That was amazing. It's important to hear these voices speak from the heart of a history that we only hear in bits and pieces. And this is a way to start filling in some gaps for a lot of people who have experienced things that need to be remembered. Our next speaker, Tia Oso, comes to us from Arizona in Southern California, but in Arizona, she's been doing some amazing work in response to some remarkable circumstances that we might not have imagined were possible a decade ago or so, if we had just been thinking about where we were headed as a people. Uh, things changed, and they're continuing to change, and we need voices like hers to speak the truth of what she feels and what the people feel that she interacts with on a daily basis. She's speaking tonight on chaos or community. It's the persistent question in achieving racial progress and human rights. Tia Oso is the national organizer for the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. And she's going to examine the historic ebb and flow of social progress and the repressive backlash that follows. Using the current context of the ongoing fight for full citizenship for African Americans, and the parallels and the contrasts with the efforts for immigrant rights as a case study. Ms. Oso will discuss the importance of black history, the unfinished business of black liberation as a cornerstone of social progress, and a central element of developing a full human rights movement in the United States today. She's gonna to touch on contemporary and historic examples of social movements and civil efforts for progress, and demonstrate how radical inclusion and alliance building have yielded the best results in organizing for the rights and liberties of all. She's a dynamic social justice leader. She's organized community justice campaigns. She's mobilized thousands of advocates to address social justice issues in the public interest. And she brings to us now a message of coalition building. And I hope you'll enjoy it. Tia. Uh, good evening, everyone. So um, before I get started, I actually want to ask everyone if y'all will um, stand up together, please. And I want to do a little exercise that's going to kind of shift our energy and get us you know, ready to talk about these issues. Um, so who is anyone here familiar with somatics? Have ever done any somatics? No? So it's a very like crunchy granola social justice -y thing to do. Um, and so somatics is basically a system of uh, like body work where it talks about like how do you embody and like experience, you know, yourself 
right, within your body. And so this is the exercise that's gonna help kind of ground us in this experience together. I am gonna talk about a lot of really heavy issues, but I want us to listen from a place of inclusion and together and community building like here in the space tonight. So um, when we talk about now, like intellectually, right, when you think about yourself or your me or your I, you think about your head, right? Like I think that I'm here. But at the beginning, you know, of like human history and when you, you were talking about um, like even like thought and philosophy and the, some of the uh, times that the poet was touching on, people thought of their self as being right here, like right in your, you know, your gut. Like it was like, oh, I feel it in my gut, right? So people used to think of like yourself was down in here in your body. So just put your hand on your stomach, like right on your belly button, right, and get there. And you don't have to close your eyes, you can stay present or if you want, you can close your eyes and like, you know, get really, really in touch with yourself. Some of the ways in we talk about in um, somatics about how we hold systemic issues in our body, right? How we hold sometimes psychological issues or stressors and all these other things, they manifest in our bodies in different ways. And so sometimes the way that oppression feels like is like it helps, it is pushing you down and you feel weighed down, right? And so this is an exercise that's gonna help you, you know, stand up to your full height. So feel how tall you are. Feel how wide you are from end to end, from back to front, like your full, you know, self. Um, and sometimes the way that oppression manifests itself is people take up more room than is theirs, right? So what's equitable and what's just and what's real is to take up exactly the amount of space that you've been allotted in your physical body. So the next thing I want you to do is put your hands down to your side and feel just how the space that you hold, this is the amount of space that you have been allotted to, right, apparently, right, by the creator who made us, <laughs> put us down here. Um, and I just want you to take a breath and feel like your breath filling all the way up maybe just to your middle. And let's let it out. And this next breath, let's try to take it all the way up until we feel all the way full. And let's feel in our bodies this moment. We're celebrating Black History Month. We've had a lot of really um, beautiful opening statements. We had a song, right, from African-American tradition. We heard music and saw dance from throughout the diaspora. We heard, you know, spoken word, which is, you know, part of many diaspora traditions. Um, and, you know, we all have a history and we all have traditions that we're standing in. And those things are history, right? It's something that has happened in the past, but we live it, right? And we relive it and we play it out in a lot of different ways. Um, and, you know, that's what's behind us, you know, both bad experiences and negative experiences, but also the legacies, right, of our ancestors and our collective, um, you know, families and everything that brought us right now, right here into this moment, into this room, right? So feel that behind you. Do you feel that behind you and what brought you here today? And then in front of us, thank you. Thank you for affirmation. Um, in front of us, right, is nothing but possibility. And that's why I titled this talk, you know, where do we go from here? Is because from here is the only place we can go from, right? And we're making a decision every day, all the time, of what it is that we're going to do here. And I'm hoping that what I discuss on tonight will give you some food for thought and some context about who it is and how it is that you want to be, right, to change the here that people are going to be experiencing later, even including yourselves. And then on the inside of us, right, let's fill ourselves with this last collective breath together with the purpose and with the resolve, right, to assume right, the best of intentions about one another, as well as to fill ourselves with the resolve that it takes in order to move forward together and do what it is that we know must be done. Together, one more time. And go ahead and let it out. You can be seated. So before I begin, I just want to say thank you to CSU Stanislaw for inviting me um, to the departments, to the faculty, to the staff. I really appreciate um, you um, inviting me here to share as a part of your Black History Month uh, festivities and celebration. I want to thank also the students and members of the community who are here on tonight as well. Thank you for sharing your time um, with me on this evening as well. Um, and also let's have another hand uh, for the wonderful performances that we saw.
Very powerful, beautiful, really rich um, experiences, really talented people. I really appreciate that so much. Um, and one of the things that I always find really interesting when we're talking about history or, you know, when I'm talking about ethnic studies is that sometimes people, you know, say, well, if we've made so much social and racial progress, you know, why is it that we have to celebrate Black History Month, right? You know, what is the point of that? And isn't it just, you know, creating more division to talk about these things? And what I really appreciate about, you know, the initiatives to acknowledge history and the initiatives to, you know, lift up different ethnicities is that the fact of the matter is, when we're talking about the United States of America and we're talking about what is American culture, all of the rich, you know, diversity of what makes up America, right, isn't reflected in what we include in and as we what we curate as American culture. A lot of it is really, you know, European culture um, and European people and European contributions that we celebrate and actually walk and live in the history of. We name buildings, right, after settlers. We name streets and highways and even, you know, institutions after, you know, people of European descent. And we don't call it celebrating history. And then, you know, when we have, you know, Black History Month, our Hispanic Heritage Month, we have to have these discussions about people, you know, trying to fight and make our rightful place to have also our history and our contributions acknowledged. Um, and so I'm always really excited to have the opportunity to talk about that and talk about it in the full context of, you know, Black History Month is not something that's just nice to do, right? It's actually the right and just thing that we should do is really acknowledge the contributions of all people in the United States, both historically and today and in the future that will be made. Um, I want to share a little bit about myself and the work that I do um, and then you know what it is that I want to kind of dig into tonight that I think will help be really um, I hope will be really instructive and uh, you know give you all food for thought. So uh, again my name is Tia Oso. I'm the national organizer for the Black Alliance for Just Immigration and I was born and raised in Mesa, Arizona in a historically segregated neighborhood called uh, known as the Washington Escobedo area and that is the area of Mesa, Arizona at the time where black and brown people were allowed to live. You know, and segregation was legal. My grandparents moved to Mesa, Arizona, um, my grandparents on my mother's side moved to Mesa, Arizona in the 30s as a result of displacement from the Dust Bowl and famine in the Midwest. And so there are a lot of uh, families that have been in Arizona for generations who moved there in the 30s from Oklahoma and Arkansas and Kansas and moved to um, find agricultural jobs there. Um, and that's where who I am, you know, on my mom's side. My dad's side, um, my father is a Nigerian immigrant um, and he moved to the United States, you know, to pursue his education and uh, met my mom at Arizona State University. And then now I'm here talking to you all today about, you know, black history and immigration and all these great things. And um, I really come to this work from both a personal perspective as well as systemic perspective and seeing the treatment of, um, in particular, uh, Mexican and Central American immigrants in Arizona around the time of the law that was passed, Senate Bill 1070 in Arizona that criminalized um, and made it a felony for immigrants to be unlawfully present in, in the state of Arizona. Um, among uh, many other things, it also mandated that local law enforcement officials um, in the course of, in, you know, pulling people over and interacting um, with individuals who had to ask them about their immigration status. Um, and seeing not only that, but also um, raids in my community and just really other oppression that was happening, I couldn't, you know, sit it out and stay silent because I was raised up, you know, understanding that it's my job and it is my duty to speak up against injustice. And when I see things that aren't right, um, you know, that's how my mother raised me. She was an organizer as well um, and a community advocate. And so when I saw what was happening in uh, my community, you know, I got out there in the streets, there were marches, there were protests, there were rallies. Um, and that's how I found out about um, you know, what it meant to, you know, participate in the immigrant rights movement and then eventually had the opportunity to work with Baji um, as a result of our executive director, Opal Tometi, who's also from Phoenix, Arizona, um, being hired by the organization. And we do work right at this intersection of racial justice and immigrant rights where we lift up issues of people of African descent and immigrants from Africa and Caribbean and Latin American countries, as well as engaging them in relationship building with African Americans because 
because we understand that when you are black in America, there's a different set of rules and a different set of structures that you have to learn in addition to right learning how America works and in addition to navigating the immigration system. Black immigrants have a whole other you know, system that they also have to learn how to navigate. And so that's the work that we do at Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Um, and so I want to invite you to, you know, maybe um, think about when you think, when I say the word immigrant, when I say, you know, when I talk about the U.S.-Mexico border, in your mind, right, if I was to say, you know, there's a young man, he had a dream, he wanted to move to Phoenix, Arizona, and he decided that even though he wasn't able to migrate legally at the time, he really knew that Phoenix is where he wanted to be. So he got his money together, he got to the U.S.-Mexico border, he bought, you know, a pair of cowboy boots and a Jeep and drove across the border and figured out, you know, everything later was able to eventually get his family also to join him, the person that you might be picturing in your mind, right, is likely Latino, right, or a brown person or an indigenous looking person. But I'm talking about my uncle. My uncle, Olushegun Osho, flew himself to Mexico City, bought a Jeep, and drove across the U.S.-Mexico border because he really, really, really wanted to live in Phoenix, Arizona. To this day, I don't really understand why, but that is, <laughs> that's how I got here. So when we talk about, you know, having to secure borders and close borders, um, if that had been the case in 1978, I would not be able to stand here before you today and talk about my story, my family, and the work of racial justice that needs to be done. Um, and that's the context where I'm coming from, is that, you know, the things that we think are very cut and dry, the narratives, the dominant narratives and frameworks that we're given um, actually are not inclusive of what's really going on in people's real lived lives. Um, and I chose this theme, you know, KSR community, um, because I think that it is not just the question that Martin Luther King Jr. had in 1967 when he wrote this book, it's his fourth book, his final book, but I think it is a persistent question that we are always asking is like, with these issues that we're facing every day, where is it that we're going to go from here? How are we going to address these problems and these issues? Are we gonna do it in a way that is um, how Martin Luther King, you know, always dreamt of a beloved community where we have have solutions that work for everyone, or is it in a way that is going to be chaotic and violent and divisive? Um, and I believe the same question, you know, at the turn of, you know, so many different points in the history of this country in particular and throughout the world, that same question is asked and we see what the fallout is and what the ramifications are, right, of when we answer one way or another. Um, in the book in particular, I'm going to read an excerpt from it for you all. Um, it deals with, um, it's 1967, right? So this is, you know, a few years after um, the civil rights movement has had some major wins and some major gains. So there's a 1964 Civil Rights Act, which abolishes, um, excuse me, which made it illegal to have um, discrimination in public accommodations. And so, you know, segregated lunch counters and things like that. There's the 1965 um, Immigration and Nationality Act, um, which also also opened up immigration, voluntary immigration to countries in Asia, in Africa, in the Caribbean. There is the 1967 um, Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which um, made illegal discrimination in things like poll taxes and grandfather clauses and Jim Crow, like we were hearing about earlier. Um, and so in the book, right, it's a few years after those things, and he's seeing how um, in response to the wins and the gains of the civil rights movement, instead of, you know, um, major social progress and togetherness and unity and love, what do we see? We see race riots all across the country we see new and more clever ways of redlining. And so banks deciding who and why and how they would um, grant home loans, right, to individuals and for what neighborhoods, right? And so instead of the government saying, okay, segregation, this neighborhood is for this color of people and that neighborhood is for these color of people, we have banks, okay? So we have private entities colluding with homeowners associations um, to say, okay, well, if the government won't say who can live here, we'll say, we'll limit who can live here. Um, and then we also see, um, you know, the kind of the progress from the civil rights movement where we have large, you know, mass mobilizations of African Americans um, fighting and, you know, doing peaceful demonstrations, um, like sit-ins, freedom rides, 
in um, you know, marching for their voting rights, we see the rise in the, the popularity um, of mass movements such as the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. We see um, the Nation of Islam gain uh, momentum in key cities where a more militant, a more radical, and also more inclusive of a variety of uh, strategies and tactics, we'll say, um, besides nonviolence, begin to gain popular, begin to gain popularity um, in response to the real, the lived reality that repression, even after all of the marching, fighting, people died, bled and died, right, in the civil rights movement, we see these persistent disparities. We see even more police repression on the streets. We see even more joblessness, even more discrimination happening um, in schools and in the private sector. And so he writes this book to ask these questions as well as we see um, the Vietnam War happening. And so he was very, very specific in calling out um, both the idea of, you know, a move away from integration and fighting for integration and inclusion to separatism and militant nationalism. Um, he calls out um, violence and imperialism of the United States military with regards to the Vietnam War. And he calls out also the white moderates. Um, and so these are, you know, well-meaning white folks who are in support of integration, right, but with uh, all deliberate speed, if you're familiar with that phrase. So it's like, yes, of course we want to integrate, but, you know, progress takes time. And this is um, a theme, a common refrain that we hear throughout um, fights for social justice and social movements is that even people who claim to be progressive will say, well, of course I want change, of course I appreciate and you know, believe that your cause is just, but these things take time. I'm going to read just an excerpt from the book. Um, and he says, the majority of white Americans consider themselves sincerely committed to justice for the Negro. They believe that American society is essentially hospitable to fair play and to steady growth toward a middle class. A middle class utopia embodying racial harmony, but unfortunately this is a fantasy of self-deception and comfortable vanity. The personal torment of discrimination cannot be measured on a numerical scale, but the grim evidence of its hold on white Americans is revealed in polls that indicate that 88% of them would object if their teenage child dated a Negro. Almost 80% would mind if a close friend or a relative married a Negro, and 50% would not want a Negro as a neighbor. The Black Power slogan did not spring full grown from the head of some philosophical Zeus. It was born from the wounds of despair and disappointment. It is a cry of daily hurt and persistent pain. Racism is a philosophy based on a contempt for life. It is the arrogant assertion that one race is the center of value and object of devotion before which other races must kneel in submission. It is an absurd dogma that one race is responsible for all the progress of history alone, and it alone can assure the progress of the future. Just such an ambivalent nation freed the slaves a century ago with no plan or program to make their freedom meaningful. The still ambivalent nation in 1954 declared school segregation unconstitutional with no plan or program to make integration real. The white liberal must see that the Negro needs not only love, but also justice. It is not enough to say that we love Negroes. We have many Negro friends. Sound familiar? They must demand justice for Negroes. They must demand justice for Negroes. Um, and it's a really, really compelling book. And the parallels of not just his book, but if you read the writings of so many people or like watch the speeches of so many people throughout the 50s and 60s, you can see direct parallels to what we see happening today. And so tonight I'm gonna talk about, you know, where is it that we're gonna go? So 50 years after he posed this question to us, right? Look where we are as a nation. Um, and where is it that we're going to go from here? Um, the persistent fight for full citizenship, right? So for the suffrage, for the right to vote, for the right to live and work where you want, for the right to social freedom. So Jim Crow, for those of you who are not familiar, is a, was a set of social mores, some written, right? So some codified in law, and then others just social rules that everybody knew and followed, and you had violent retribution if you did not follow those rules that codified how you 
could interact with people of different races, where you could go, what you could do, um, and demanded and codified deference of um, black people towards whites. And today we have still entrenched, right, a set of social rules. So are, is, is it not true that there are places where if you are black, you will be stopped and maybe looked at suspiciously if you happen to be there? If you're just not white at all, right? There are plenty of places where somebody just might stop and ask you, well, where are you from? Anybody ever had somebody do that to you? You know, or you're maybe you're shopping in a store and you just notice that the clerk happens to be very, very helpful and interested in making sure that you make your purchase. <laughs> right? So it may not be written down, but is it still in practice? And so I have three key points that I'm gonna, you know, reiterate throughout the night is that the answers to these questions, you know, where is it that we're gonna go from here can be found in both policy as well as practice and then also in the personal, right? Because it is in our hearts and minds that we manifest our uh, reality. And that's where these things begin and that is where they end as well. And if we don't stretch and expand our definition of humanity and what it is that is acceptable and what it is that we're willing to fight for, um, we're going to continue to have these you know, periods of progress, right? Where the oppressed rise up and demand, right? That we're not going to take this anymore and then we're gonna have regression because the larger society refuses to include them, right? In the full definition of humanity. So we're going to start with African Americans, and I talk about you know the fight for full citizenship. When we talk about citizenship, when we talk about um, you know what does it mean to be uh, African American or Black American in the United States, um, we have this again revisionist history. We talk about you know Martin Luther King solved all of that, even though he was assassinated right in 1968, and you know Black people are just lazy. I don't know why they don't want to achieve. You know, all of these um, different things have been outlawed and taken care of, so we don't know why we have, you know, record rates of incarceration. We don't know why we have voter disenfranchisement. Black people don't want to vote. Black people don't want to work. Black people don't want to go to school. Why don't we have more African American students, you know, in our uh, university system? Why don't local African Americans participate in the fantastically robust public university system in California? It's mind boggling, isn't it? They must not care about education. Is that the case? No. no. I would challenge you. Every single time I do either, either a big talk or even a small workshop, you know, in the back of people's minds, either they will say it out loud, but or you can tell that people do hold these deeply held biases and beliefs. And that's the personal, right? That's the gut of where we are practicing our public, you know, um, social order making, right? That's how we make laws. That's how we treat and regard people. In the back of our minds, in our guts, in our self, right? down here, that is where um, our, we're coming from and how we're regarding people. And I believe that it is, comes from those biases that when we're making policies and regulations as far as admittance or as far as something like um, you know, voter ID programs, when we're um, making our um, you know, admissions uh, categories, we are coming from a place of, you know, we're assuming, right, you know, this is what's best for everyone, this is what is fair and equitable, but without the actual context of how things are being practiced, right? So if African American students are not being tracked into a curriculum that is gonna make them college ready, what is their opportunity to do successfully on their college applications and in college admissions, right? You know, is a third grade African American student thinking to themselves, I don't care about education, right? How? Not possible. You can ask them, right? You know, everybody, every little kid know they gotta go to school. So what are the practices that are happening in the course of their education that make it so that they either don't make it to graduation or they're not prepared to do well in university or when they get to university, what are the practices at that university, right? That make it so that they're not able to matriculate and successfully graduate. So that at the societal level, then we say, oh, well, they're just not achievers and they're not up to the challenge. Similarly, when we had the, and that has to do with how not just the 
practice, right, the policy that was put in place that says, okay, every school is desegregated, it's illegal to discriminate in your admissions, right? But in practice, what are the standards that are set and are they inclusive of, you know, the lived realities of all of our students and all of our communities? And then also in the policy, are our universities and other public accommodations, right, practicing in a way that is equitable, that is just. And when there is discrimination, right, when there is a problem, when there is an issue, are those things taken seriously, right? And do we correct them? Or do we allow them to stay persistent over time, over generations, so that we don't see growth and parity happening in African-American communities? When the 13th Amendment was passed, right? And first the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by President Lincoln, and then the 13th Amendment was passed. If you're familiar with the 13th Amendment, it abolished slavery, right? It made slavery illegal, except for, right, when someone is incarcerated. So is slavery legal in the United States? Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. And, you know, lo and behold, before, you know, 1868, we didn't have a large prison population. Right after the 13th Amendment is passed, next we have debt peonage, we have, you know, mass incarceration system. Now, 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, we have over... 2 million people incarcerated, over 25% of which are African Americans. Now, is it just that, you know, the United States of America, which incarcerates the most number of our citizens out of any other country on the planet, uh, for every 100,000 citizens we have in the United States, or people that we have living in the United States, 716 are incarcerated. Now, is America a lawless place? And we just have, you know, everybody's just running amok and we just got to lock everybody up because they don't know how to act. Or is this a system that was put in place to replace another system? And when we talked about, you know, okay, you know, slavery was bad. We got to make some progress. We got to do something. We're ready to grant full citizenship rights to all, you know, people that we are holding enslaved now, as well as all Native Americans. Is that what happened? No. And so those same, you know, exceptions prove to be the most persistent, right? The most pers persistent barriers to true social progress. So instead of actually a community lift and a collective, um, you know, uplift for everyone, instead of true emancipation, instead of true freedom, instead of true, you know, forward social movement, we have an exception. And that exception proves to be stronger, right, than the progress that's being made. So that 50 years after the civil rights movement has won all of these gains, we see um, both racial job disparities, income disparities, um, wealth disparities that are equal to or worse than in 1967. Now, and that's right here now today. So what does it look like, right, in policy and in practice and in the personal for us to fight for the full citizenship and for the full human dignity of all people, including and starting with African Americans, because our system started with, right, and then the founding of this country also started with and it was based upon the enslavement of African people, right? And that's why when we're talking about, you know, Black Lives Matter, that's why we have to start there. It's not because only Black Lives Matter or, you know, people are just so obsessed with race. It is in our system, right? It's written in the DNA of the United States. So until these issues are fully addressed, and by fully addressed, we mean acknowledged, as well as corrected, as well as reversed, right? So it's not enough for us to just stop. It's not enough for us to just, okay, emancipation, the slaves were freed in the South, right? But that wasn't enough. These things have to be corrected for in order for us to actually fully be able to make progress and really move forward. And one of the things that um, Martin Luther King talks about in the book about, you know, how do we solve these persistent problems of poverty and inequity, um, and far from, you know, Marxism or communism, he says, in order for us to solve these issues here in the United States, we need to begin to guarantee not just social welfare programs, but a guaranteed basic income for everyone, for everyone, no matter who you are, you're going to have a guaranteed basic income to make sure that your needs are met. That's how we're going to solve poverty. It makes sense to me, 
but it's a radical idea even still now today in the conversations that we're having about, you know, how do we solve poverty? How do we solve inequity? It's still considered a radical idea. And at the time of his death, Martin Luther King was actually um, publicly ridiculed and his ideas, especially around um, solving poverty and militarism, um, had made him something of a social um, outcast. In his uh, popularity, his approval ratings, right, if there were polls at that time, his approval ratings would have been like under 30%. And in that, behind the policies and the practices of um, what we see behind those disparities is our internal and deeply held beliefs and biases of anti-blackness. And so what anti-blackness is, it's not, again, a personal thing. It's not a, this is, I'm not talking about prejudice. I'm talking about systemic racism. I'm talking about at the systemic level as well as the biases that are ingrained in our society that black is associated with bad, associated with negative, associated with stigma, and those attributes are also assigned to those people. So that in our social hierarchy, right, if we have African Americans situated at the bottom, even when we talk about immigrants and immigrants of color that have been able to assimilate because of their proximity to whiteness, when I talk about being an immigrant, right, there's a cognitive dissonance where people don't quite, it doesn't quite compute, they don't quite get it. Because I'm looking at you, it's like, well, you're black. Yes, yes I am. And I'm also an immigrant. And even though there are over three to five million black immigrants in the United States, might as well be invisible. And that doesn't have to do with people not knowing or us not being, they're all over the place. We're everywhere, we're kicking butt, we're getting, you know, my nephew was admitted to like three or four different Ivy League schools with a million dollars worth of scholarship monies. and. It's, you know, it's evident, right? He's definitely Nigerian, like both of his parents are Nigerian. And, you know, the headline says, you know, African-American <laughs> senior <laughs> at Ironwood High School gets a million dollars worth of scholarships. And it's not that he's not African-American, right? It's just the fact that, you know, he is an immigrant. He's both black and an immigrant, but our deeply held bias of what black means, right? Being negative and having that negative connotation is what creates that internal bias and that lens and that filter right, so that we can't see what's happening. Um, it's also what is um, attributed to a lot of health disparities. So African Americans not only suffer health disparities at greater rates um, than people of other races, including other people of color, but also receive a lower quality of care from their doctors, um, are likely to receive lower doses of anesthetic because we're assumed to be able to withhandle um, higher rates of pain, um, and are also, um, often attributed negatively as far as like doctor's charts and our attitudes. Um, a lot of times there'll be comments such as, you know, uh, what do you call it, uncooperative and, you know, ha you know is not likely to recover. Um, I'll share another personal anecdote. My mother suffered a stroke in 2009 and one of the um, issues that we had was that her, at every point in her recovery, me and my family would be very, very, you know, optimistic about her outcomes and her chance to recover. And we're like, you know, we want her to have therapy. We want her to have occupational therapy, speech therapy. We know the stroke was severe. She had actually had strokes, you know, prior to that, but we believe that she's gonna re recover. And every doctor who was in charge of her care, and it's not that they weren't well-meaning. Again, I'm not talking about attitudes. I'm not talking about people's personal feelings. They really seriously were trying to um, dampen and lower our expectations of whether or not my mother was going to recover. We were told that she wasn't going to live long. She wasn't going to be able to um, recover from the stroke. She wasn't going to be able to ever eat with her own teeth again, not feed herself, all of these things. Um, and at the time, it was devastating to me to have to experience this because, again, me and my siblings said, no, she's going to recover. We believe that she's going to get better. And we believe that she deserves the best care possible. She deserves therapy, she deserves the treatments, she deserves for you all as her doctors and her <laughs> health professionals to also be encouraging that she get the very best. Um, but with your lower expectations, they're not approving these therapies, they're not approving the treatments. Um, and I'm happy to say that my mother is still living today. Um, she has made a remarkable level of recovery. She's not 100% recovered, but she has lived much longer than the expectations 
expectations of what it is they were trying to tell us. And as I began to study the medical system and racial disparities, this is one of the things that I noticed was that if you are African American, particularly if you're very dark skinned, um, as well as overweight, which she's also, um, you know, obese, that impacts the way that you're cared for, what type of care that you're given, what type of treatments that you're approved for. Um, and it is a systemic issue, right, over and over again. And that's why we say, you know, Black Lives Matter. That's why we talk about addressing anti-Blackness and systemic issues, because if Black people are not seen as people, not seen as human, not seen as healthy, not seen as people who are going to and are worthy of the investment of what it means for us to recover or have an education or be able to live and grow and thrive, then we get policies and practices like disparate health care, right? We also get policies and practices where we have uh, the President of the United States saying that he's going to send in the National Guard to deal with uh, intra-community violence in urban cities, when intra-community violence in urban cities is not a matter of lawlessness and is more a matter of what poverty, after school education, um, and activities teen job availability, right? Those are the correlations for what we see happening in intercommunity violence, but we have policy and practice that says these people are wild and need to be controlled. And so we're gonna send the military in to handle that problem. Shifting over to when we're talking about immigration, we see a parallel issue, right, where as people of color were allowed to immigrate. So before people of color were allowed to immigrate, we had the forced migration of African people. So the forced labor in transatlantic slave trade and then bred here in captivity. Um, after we have the emancipation and the civil rights movement that opens up opportunities. And throughout that time, we did have uh, migration from other non-European countries, but it was for the purpose of labor, right? So we have, um, you know, we wanna have people uh, come from China to help build these the railroads. We want to have people from uh, Mexico and Central America to come and work in the mines and things of that nature. Voluntary migration, family-based migration didn't really happen and wasn't really open to non-European countries until after the gains and the push of the civil rights movement and these broader human rights movements of the time. Um, and so again, each country that um, is able to come to the United States, we have varying levels of acceptance, varying levels of assimilation, all with this idea that we're gonna maintain the current racial system and maintain the current power structure. Um, but we have the issue, right, where there are too many immigrants that are growing and thriving in these communities despite repression, right? Despite oppression, despite discrimination. And so the statistics start coming out, you know, this county is over 50% non-white. That county's over 50% non-white. You know, in 20, or I think it was 2015 or 2013, it was 51% of babies that were born were non-white. And these are just facts, right? But the way that they're reported was like, the boogeyman is coming, right? Something is wrong. These are, <laughs> this is something to be scared about. We started seeing this frenzy and this fear being generated among American society, particularly white people, to be afraid of people who are quote unquote, not American. So now, even though we're all here, we've been here for a while, right? All of a sudden we start seeing these lines drawn and instead of, you know, people just being born whatever wonderful color it is that they are, now you're non-white. And, you know, in order to maintain American society, American culture, we need to stem immigration. But I thought we were a nation of immigrants. How is it the narrative starts to shift when the color of who's American starts to shift? And what is that rooted in? It's still in anti-blackness and still in discrimination, but also in the unnamed, right? white supremacist power structure. So we don't want to say keep America white, so we're going to say make America great again. I'm going to use a couple of code words, a couple of code words in there. And so as immigrants, you know, achieve, as immigrants, communities, again, grow and thrive and they begin to gain parity, we start to see repression. We start to see the backlash. And a couple of things that we've noticed within the immigrant rights movement is in response to the repression and the backlash, so criminalizing immigrants, demonizing immigrants, uh, you have, you know, Fox News talking about the browning of America. Again, there's a boogeyman. People can't just be people and just, you know, in their communities doing their thing. It's a problem. It's a menace. That's coming, um, we see an immigrant rights movement that said, okay, this is America. 
similar to the civil rights movement. What we need to do is prove that we want to be patriots. We want to be good Americans. We're here to participate. We're here to work. You know, we're not here to cause trouble. We're not criminals, right? Does anybody remember that? We're not criminals. We just come here to work. We do the jobs that other people don't want to do. So then fast forward 10 years later, 2016, 2015, 2014, all of a sudden, what becomes criminalized? Just being an immigrant just being here without having you know, your citizenship or your visa expiring, what used to be a civil offense for people who don't know immigration law and policy, being without a status in the United States is not a felony. And it was not a felony. It's basically a matter of like civil paperwork. It's like, you know, you're out of status with the United States government. It's something that you need to take care of. But, and to this day in our constitution, it doesn't hold any type of uh, criminal penalty. So it's not mandatory that these people be rounded up and locked up and detained and then deported. It is a matter of policy and a matter of practice. People are literally being made criminals and criminalized just for being. Does that sound familiar, African-American people? Just your being, right, now is unlawful in Jim Crow. When you were a slave, it was fine for you to be right next to me, right up under me, cooking my food, nursing my babies, right? When you get free, you can't even walk on the sidewalk next to me, right? So when you were here to pick our crops and go home and go back across the border, that was fine that you didn't quite, you know, your work permit's out of status. Oh, you know, you brought your uncle over here to help out. Okay, that's fine. You know, when your family starts going to our schools, wait a second. Now I need to see your papers. So we see these parallel tracks and the issue and the uh, anomaly that I will bring up and lift up is that when we're talking about building the immigrant rights movement, instead of talking about this larger question, right, and really unpacking these myths around citizenship, around Americanness, and also calling out the racism, right, within, you know, demonizing and racing brown people as not American, instead of calling that out, we said, okay, we're going to use an assimilationist narrative, right, and this narrative around, you know, wanting to be American. And what African Americans can always share with any group that's coming to the United States is like, you know what, these people really don't care how much you want to try to get along, right? They will find a way to cut you out of what it means to be American because at the founding, again, and rooted in the codification, both personal and policy, rooted in the founding of America of who is a citizen, it is defined as a white land-owning male. And we've been on a continuum and a progress since that moment, right, to try to, you know, okay, let's get this definition to be a little bit more inclusive. And so white landowning males, okay, well, maybe you don't have to own any land. Okay, well, maybe women can be citizens too, and maybe they can go ahead and vote too, you know, a couple hundred, you know, over a hundred years later. Okay, well, now you black people want to get free. Okay, that's fine. Well, now you want to vote too? Okay, well, now Native Americans want to vote? Well, not everybody who comes over here wants to vote. No, we got to turn, you know, we got to slow this thing down. And that's what we see happening out here today. So in the answer to this question, you know, KSR community, where is it that we're going to go? Instead of, you know, 150 years after emancipation, we had the first, you know, person of African descent in the White House, right? A lot of Americans, not a majority of Americans, but that's okay, a lot of Americans answered that question by saying, you know, we're gonna go ahead and opt for chaos. I do not believe that the definition of who can be a leader of this country, who can be American, and what America means includes you. And even though his approval ratings were high, even though he took the country from debt and financial ruin to, uh, you know, fiscally solvent and job growth, you know, record months of job growth and all of these different things, persistently, if you were to ask people how they felt, again, personal, how they felt about the condition of the country, they were successfully convinced that we were doing really poorly. Now, if I put on my real radical hat, there's a lot of things that Barack Obama was doing really poorly. The record deportations, right? Militarism, drone strikes, authorizing drone strikes in the Middle East, um, you know, destabilizing African and Middle Eastern governments. There was a lot of things he was doing wrong. 
Um, but that's not what the people who were answering that poll were talking about. They were talking about in their gut, I don't feel like, right, he's doing a very good job. And I don't feel like he really represents America. I know that he said he was born here, but I don't feel like his birth certificate is real. <laughs> so what is it that we say to these things? Why is it that these persistent questions of what it takes for us to be a community, what makes a community, you know, jobs, parks, schools, just generally a feeling of family and safety and inclusion. And then we persistently see both with African Americans and with the progress of immigrants, we have uh, policies put in place and practices carried out to criminalize, to shun, to say you are a threat and a menace, right, to society. You're a security risk, okay? After we see September 11th and now we have a whole slew of laws that demonize and criminalize people just for being Muslim are looking uh, like an idea of what people think a Muslim looks like. Right? And people in these have real actual ramifications for people's lives where they're being charged with terrorism, being deported, being banned from traveling to the United States because of their religion. Right? Repeatedly, when we say, how is it that we're going to move forward together, we keep redefining who is the we, right? Who is American and what together means and how we're going to move forward. And so my challenge for us is to redefine because it's very, very easy to have these, you know, types of conversations where we're thinking about, you know, what needs to happen and we see the problems and we see the issues. But in our gut and in our person and in ourself, when we interact with people who do not look like us, right, do we see that person is community? Do we see that person as beloved? Do we see that person as my fellow human being? Or are we afraid? Are we suspicious? is our instinct to protect ourselves and protect what's ours, right? When you, you know, I grew up in a segregated area. So in my neighborhood, if a white person walked down the street, what's going on? <laughs> who is that? Do you know who that is? That's probably the cops, right? What are they doing in this neighborhood? Um, and you know, sometimes we were right, but my <laughs> the problem is, the problem is that that defensiveness, right, that divisiveness and that instinct to protect and to close off from people who are different, right, is what these policies and practices become rooted in, right? And that's what we take into the voting booth. That's what we take into our homeowners association meetings. That's what we take into, you know, our homes and that to our dinner tables is that attitude and that idea. So today when um, I believe it's either Department of Homeland Security or Department of the Justice, I can't even keep track now with all the things that are coming out. When they say, you know, we're going to remove these protections from students who are gender non-conforming to be able to safely use the bathroom. And if I, as a woman, in the back in my gut, right in the back of my mind, I say, oh, well, you know what? I am a little uncomfortable because, like, you know, do I want to be in the bathroom with somebody who I, you know, I don't know what they have going on down there, right? If that's how I feel, right, and then that's how I'm able to vote, what I have just done is not only, you know, because I can say it's because I don't feel safe, right, and that's what I need to happen. What I've done is I've criminalized that person's body. What I've said is that you don't belong in public, right? You don't have the right as a human being to relieve yourself, you know, biologically, even though we all have that same need. And also what I've said is socially, I am sentencing you to, for some individuals, that is a death sentence. Because what I've said is like, you don't involve and you're not included in the human family, simply because you're a different gender than I am. And that is really what it means. What it does mean is that when black people are killed at the hands of police and repeatedly our system does not deliver justice. That is what we're saying. It's like we have these rules in place and we have the system in order, right? And when justice is not served and when repeatedly you can get away with killing people, right? What is it that we're saying? Well, that wasn't a person, was it? Right? When people can be denied their right to vote because they don't have a card, because they don't have a document that they were never issued in the first place. My mom was not born in a hospital. Her birthday, I think her birthday is February 27th, and I'm going to go home on Monday and celebrate her birthday with her. But if you ask her, she'll say, well, actually, that's just the number that they wrote down on the paperwork by the time they got down to the <laughs> county to file her birth certificate. Because back in the day when she was born, okay, in 1947, if you were black, you were not allowed to go to the hospital. You had to be at the brink of death, and so that's when you went. So she was born in the same living room that I grew up playing in. 
right? So when we are answering this persistent question, my invitation to all of us is to answer the question with radical inclusion. And that means yes, and that means everybody, and that means even if I do not understand, even if it's not familiar to me, even if I don't know you, even if you look different, sound different, think or speak or act different, my answer is first gonna be a yes and an open and an extended hand of love. What that also means is us shifting away from civil rights, right? Because we're, if we're civilly participating in a system that is biased and a system that is unjust, what we're doing is reinforcing structures that are inequitable and strengthening them instead of challenging them and radically remaking them. And so we need to also be thinking more radically about what it is you know, to change. Why is it, so if we know that we live in a society where you have to have money to live and to you know, do what it is that you need to do to survive, right? And have human dignity, why is the idea of a universal basic income so radical and so out there and so wild and crazy? And we're the same people that want to go to the moon and Mars and all these things, but the idea that everybody's going to get a check, right? So I will pay in New York City, I will pay $60,000 in tax dollars a year to keep you locked up, but that same $60,000 I wouldn't give you in a check. Does it make sense? Like when you just think about it, like does it make sense? Does it make sense that we have every single day 40,000 non-citizens locked up? We guarantee, we sign a contract that says that we will lock up 40,000 immigrants a day. Our government says it at the count of $30,000 per person. But if I write a piece of legislation that says every non-citizen that doesn't have a job, their pay is gonna be $30,000 a day. I will be laughed out of the Senate, wouldn't I? But they will sign that bill, right, and pay Geo Group and CCA to keep these people locked up, that same, the same amount of money. So when we think about, you know, what's radical and what it is that needs to be done, I would challenge us to think outside the box and think radically, right, about how we're going to create a system that works for everyone because it is a system and we are all connected and we are paying this money anyway, right? Our resources are, not, are already being allocated to these things. People are already, we're already dependent upon immigrant labor for the food that we eat, for the roads that we drive on, for the houses and the homes that we live in, taking care of our children, right? We're, de we're already dependent upon it. So it's not that we're, you know, these people are taking somebody else's jobs. If they're taking, you know, I mean, just to be really frank about it, if that was someone else's job, how is it that they heard about it all the way from thousands of miles away to come over here and do the job and do the work? If there was an American who was raring to go and already ready to do it, let's just be honest about that. These false narratives are actually putting into practice destructive and unsustainable systems of oppression. Um, during the, this last kind of iteration of American policy where, you know, eventually we were able to fight for uh, an amnesty bill and people who weren't, uh, who didn't have their paperwork were able to apply and get, you know, their citizenship or get their permanent residency. Um, what led up to that um, was the sanctuary cities where we had faith communities that opened their doors um, to people largely uh, from Central American communities and say, you know, we'll protect you. We'll house you here and we're not going to let you be, you know, locked up because you are a part of our community. Um, and one of the ideas that we're thinking about now with Black Alliance for Just Immigration is that, you know, these issues are not actually about immigration and immigration policy. These issues are, again, these kind of larger issues around racial equity, around exclusion and inclusion, around impression. And so we're looking at a framework that we're calling freedom cities. And instead of talking about what we don't want and what we're against, let's talk about what we're for. We are for, you know, communities where people can live and thrive and not have to worry about racial profiling and not have to worry about police brutality, not have to worry about gentrification and homelessness and push out, not have to worry about having to choose between whether to feed their family or afford their medication. What does it look like for us to demand? Again, not just protest and resist. Protest and resistance is a part of our tradition and it's definitely necessary. However, we also need to start to build and create and demand right, a just and inclusive society and begin to articulate and define what that is. And so that's what our Freedom Cities initiative is going to be about is a radically inclusive community-led uh, initiative where we all come to the table together 
at our intersecting points of issues, so we're talking about immigrant rights, but we're also talking about human rights, we're also talking about healthcare, we're also talking about schools and what's going on with children, we're also talking about, you know, what is it, you know, these public goods like parks, like uh, green spaces, like the environment, all of these different things, and inviting people to, you know, come to the table together because it's going to take all of us, right, and all of these issues, these issues don't happen in a vacuum, so what does it look like for us to work together, right? Um, to build and create the society that we want because we know that we're not satisfied with what it is that we've been given. Um, and so I'll close with another quote um, from the KSR Community book by Martin Luther King Jr. And he says, because um, a lot of this is also about not just, well, I'll give you one more P, you know, policy, practice, and personal. A lot of this is also about power. Who has it? Who's trying to maintain it? Um, and so in KSR community, Martin Luther King Jr. talks about power and he says power at its best is love implementing the demand of justice. I'll say that again. Power at its best is love implementing the demand of justice. Justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against justice. Again, justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love and justice. What are we using our power to do? What are we using our power to build and to create, right? And not, again, just to acknowledge, but also to build, to correct, to develop, to grow and to strengthen. Um, that's the question that I'm going to leave you with on tonight. Thank you. I'd like to just take a few moments um, to open it up if anybody has any percolating questions for either of our speakers or if you had general comments that you wanted to make in reference to uh, this evening. We definitely want to open up the opportunity. There's a microphone over here, actually I think on both, both ends if anyone dares to be a brave soul, <laughs> or if you, if you don't want to use the mic, um, we're a small enough bunch if you um, would be willing to, to just speak on it. But any comments or questions? Hmm. Anyone? Come on now, don't be shy. Thank you. Um, first off, uh, thank you for coming Thank you. Thank you. Can you can you repeat that question and when you answer it? I was just sharing a comment about how um, when I was talking about like the three points about personal and policy and practice, um, just kind of in agreement of that, and you know, saying that it's something that should also be taught, right? And institutionalized like those frameworks and like a racial justice framework and ethnic studies um, would help people be able to understand those things more. Is that a good summary? Yeah. And that she uh, loves uh, Brother Sankofa's poetry, which we all, yes, we all agree. <laughs> Hello, um, I didn't hear the question that you stated, so maybe um, for those of us in the back, if you wanted to restate it again, uh, but I also wanted to state a question that transitions from what I believe was a conversation about ethnic studies, I'm not sure, 
Uh, but here at CSU Status Loss, uh, we only have two full-time tenure-track faculty positions in ethnic studies, one that focuses on Asian American studies and one that focuses on Chicano Latino studies, which is, in my opinion, a problem. So often in the university, the question is about numbers, right? Like, do you have majors? Do you have minors? Do you have a certain population that this major, you know, or this, you know, uh, department will serve? So I wanted to get your thoughts about the importance, for example, of someone who teaches African American studies and it could be from a diasporic perspective, right, in light of the conversation we're having, or in light of poetry, right, that this field can really integrate really creative methods. So we also don't have Native American studies, which, you know, wasn't touched upon, but it's all related. So I just wanted to get your thoughts about that in, in, in the sense of why would it be important to have Native American studies or African American studies, or in general, just ethnic studies? Sure. Um, I think uh, that's, those are really good points, and I think that uh, it's definitely important to have ethnic studies, and even um, like the first comment was about how you know these things need to be integrated; they need to be a part of a core curriculum um, because we're not dealing with what's really happening, right? And we're not getting at the root um, and the you know idea of you know what's radical. All radical really means is getting to the root, and so if we're not talking about um, you know, what happened to and what's currently happening to indigenous communities, right? And like, not just the founding of this country, but right now, currently, um, shout out to Standing Rock and Dakota Access Pipeline protests, and also indigenous communities that are protesting across the globe. If we're not talking about those things, and we're not actually getting a thorough and full education, we're not getting the full context. Similarly, if we're not talking about anti-blackness at the core and as the fulcrum, right, of our racial hierarchy, again, you're not getting the full context and so then when you're talking about and developing your own theory of change your analysis it's not full and so a lot of the experiences that we're having now in trying to build like multiracial movement building a multiracial progressive um, initiatives you know we have people who have a limited context right um, and also sometimes the way that um, the studies are taught and are shared is again where, okay, what happened with Native Americans happened in the past. They're not taught anything about what's happening right now. You know, African Americans, civil rights movement is over. It was one apparently, now we need to move on. Like that's the kind of like limited and incomplete context that people are moving from. And it is again, I think one of the reasons why we have these persistent issues and not really achieve, we achieve like really uneven progress. As she put it very right there when she said uneven, because when you don't know what has transpired in the past, you cannot know what's going to happen in the future. And a lot of what's happening with Black Lives Matter, with black people in this country, and I said before, it's not just here in, in America, you know. We live here within the America, but particularly for black people, this is a global problem, okay? This is not just happening here. As I said earlier in one of my poems that, the Kuris or the Aborigines make up one to two percent of the total population in Australia, yet they make up 24 to 26 percent of the prison population. Okay, so that's not by accident, that is by design. So if we don't understand what is happening that has happened in the past, there's no way you're going to be able to deal with what's happening at the current moment, at this moment right now. So we have to look back at what's going on and we have to teach the truth about what has happened and history as well as what's going on right now. Okay, so until we start doing that, we're gonna still be, in my opinion, fighting against this system and we have to have ownership and that's one, one of the things that's not happening is not having that ownership. Any other questions? We got one up here. Is that Tatiana? Oh, you're next. <laughs> okay. um, hi. Thank you so much for coming out here today. I just wanted to know what is both of your uh, inspirations in general for what you do and why you come out here? Um, I can start. My 
inspiration really started with my mom. Um, she taught me like at a young age to you know stand up for what's right and what I believe in. So you know one of my first organizing um, initiatives I ever did was I was 11 years old and in junior high, um, and I've always been you know a bigger kid. And I had a social studies teacher who was like a now I understand like a fitness buff, and so he's like you know American kids are fat. And um, when we, I went to school, um, I went to lunch that day, you know, I noticed that all of the choices in the cafeteria are like fattening, you know, french fries and ice cream. And so I was like, well, I don't want to have to listen to him, you know, talking about how fat we are. And then they're feeding us all this fattening food. So me and my friend started a petition and got our junior high cafeteria to open a salad bar. Like just always, you know, my mom instilled that in me. It's like, you know, if you don't like something that's going on, you can change it. And so I just, would and just the idea that me understanding that like that taught me at a young age that I have power and I can take initiative and I can make a difference and I can make a change um, and so that's what really I think inspires me broadly is that people are so powerful that's we true. all have power that's we have power as individuals we have power together um, and a lot of the ways that uh, the system of uh, that oppressive systems because um, the system is not apart from us right we're in it um, a lot of the ways that oppressive systems persist is because we don't see our power and we don't see what it is that we can do to help to change it. Uh, I was inspired to actually start writing. Uh, what does it say Muhammad Ali when I lived in Australia? Um, and then also Malcolm X. When I first read his book, uh, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, that inspired me to actually literally change my name. Back in 94, uh, I had a more European-esque name. Uh, all Africans born within the Americas, if you were not born with a traditional African name, Mobutu or Sankofa or what have you, we were given the slave master's name from the plantation and or the slave master's name. So I was inspired by those two great gentlemen to actually change my name. And there's a lady that I recommend that you all have a look at. Her name is Jane Elliott. Uh, I saw Jane Elliott in 84, 85 on the Oprah show. And she really inspired me to get in and start looking at what I could contribute to making a change. I had this voice. And so I started a clothing label in Australia called Black Power Clothing. And so she inspired me along with Malcolm X and, uh, as I said, uh, Muhammad Ali to start getting into poetry. So I got started pretty much at a very early age uh, in writing. Others? My name? Uh, Sankofa means to go back and fetch your roots or retrieve your roots, wisdom from learning from the past to better your future. My first name, Kinara, is the candle holder. Are you familiar with Kwanzaa, anyone? Well, it's the candle holder, the seven place candle holder. My middle name, which is Nia, N-I-A, means purpose, having a purpose in life. So I chose that myself. I wasn't given that. So uh, it's a great question. Thank you for asking. There's a question up front here. Please bring it. In regards to solidarity, um, what do you think that we need to do individually and collectively to respond to the increased fear, antagonism, and hate crimes? What do we need to do individually? And collectively. Well, we have to own our fears. You know, a lot of us don't want to own our fears, um, and we don't want to, in my opinion, deal with um, our own past pains. As a human being, I feel that it's important that we first deal with the inner first to get an understanding of who we are as an individual. And once we are able to deal with our own past, I think her name is Dr. DeGruy. Larry, she's a uh, psychologist, clinical psychologist. She broke um, post-traumatic slave syndrome and post-traumatic stress disorder. And many a times we don't want to deal with our own stuff. So as an individual, I have to deal with me first in order to be the best person that I can be. And then start looking at what I can do to contribute into the world. And then speak to those people with the good vibration. What I mean by good vibration, positive energy, positive uh, vibration, 
whereas we can sit down collectively and deal with what pain and truth that we can share with one another. So I think those teams are important. Um, in regards to solidarity, one of the things that I am really a proponent of and have been for a long time is people um, being really um, ready to make a sacrifice, um, especially at a moment now where we are, you know, with these most recent directors from the Department of Homeland Security expanding the priorities for deportation to really anybody who's not a citizen. So even permanent residents that have a criminal record or some type of criminal, you know, some type of interaction with police are now subject to deportation. Even, you know, with an identity as, you know, African American woman living in the United States, even I still have the privilege of citizenship. And so I'm thinking about what is it that I'm willing to do what is it that I'm willing to use my privilege to put myself on the line for these communities and for communities that are more vulnerable? Um, for, so I'm thinking about undocumented immigrant communities. I'm thinking about trans communities. I'm thinking about um, people who are, you know, houseless. And you know, what is it that I can do, and how can I use my privilege to a sacrificial level? Am I willing to sacrifice my finances, my reputation, my freedom, in order to help protect? are in order to help like be in co-struggle, right, with people who um, don't share the, my same identity or my same um, level of privilege in society at this point in time. Um, and for everybody, you know, the answer is different. Um, but I know that for me, um, and I'll just share, right now there is a crisis of uh, displacement dealing with um, Haitian people throughout the Haitian diaspora. So these are people who were displaced by the earthquake in 2010 um, and were able to travel to and live in South American countries like Venezuela, Chile, Brazil on humanitarian visas and work visas. Um, and another thing, in addition to ethnic studies, just global social justice studies in general is really important because the same thing that's happening here with this rise of like right-wing populism and government it has has been happening throughout Latin America. And so we have like this rise of right wing government leadership. Um, and there was even a basically a, a coup, um, a political coup that happened in Brazil. So they deposed like the um, socialist, you know, Afro-Brazilian woman president that they had. This uh, right wing government has been put in place, devastated the economy. Right, they almost ran out of money to put on the Olympics, and this population of Haitians that had been living there um, was put out of work and displaced, and have walked, and they have walked five months, some of them, to get to the United States. Um, and when our country switched their policy and decided to the to start deporting Haitians, not admitting these Haitian people. Now they're being detained, now they're being deported, their families are being split up. And these are people who literally have walked through five different countries, through jungles and um, all different types of horrific uh, abuses, um, have paid you know, money to smugglers, all of these different things. And now they're, you know, some of them are here, um, some of them are being detained, um, some of them have already been deported, they're deporting like 300 people a week. Um, and when I meet those individuals who have sacrificed so much just to get to the United States, and I was born here, and I've never wanted anything bad enough to spend one day outside, let alone five months walking somewhere, I really am challenged to think about what is it that I'm willing to do, right, in order to get to the same level of dedication and sacrifice that these people have already demonstrated, right, in their journey as an immigrant. Um, and so those are the types of questions that I ask myself when I'm asking yourself, you know, what is it that you can do, Tia? Because there are people who have lived through hell just to get here. And, you know, so signing a petition, that is great, right? But these people have put their lives on the line. People have their lives on the line, right? So what do I have on the line? What do I have, you know, what skin do I have in the game? Any final concluding questions or comments? There's one more. Um, I was wondering if you could repeat um, the last thing, the question you left us with pertaining to justice. Oh, hold on. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, what does, what is it that we want? What does freedom look like? So not just, you know, where do we go from here, KS, our community? That's the question that Martin Luther King is uh, leaving us with. My question is, you know, what does community look like? What does justice look like? What does freedom look like? What does love look like? What do we mean? Um, because I do think that 
the reason why this chaos or community is a persistent question is because we've not answered what it is that we want. Um, and I am very much like, you know, a lot of folks know me from the Net Roots Nation Action Right Disrupted Presidential Town Hall. Um, I am 100% all about disruption and <laughs> shutting things down. Like, that's what I do. Um, and also at the same time, as I'm saying, you know, this system has to be transformed and torn down. Transformed into what? We have to be going for something. It's very clear that um, the people who are creating, right, and maintaining this unjust system, they have a very clear plan in place of what it is that they want and how they want things to be. And too often on our side of things, we're so consumed with resistance, and rightfully so, because it is nuts, and it is consuming, and it is it preoccupies us. And I think that's one of the reasons why the system is so effective, because we are scrambling all the time. Um, until we can state what we want, you know, where is it that we're going? We're not going to be able to get there. You can't, you know, be driving without a destination. So yeah, that's my question is, you know, what does that look like? What is community? What is the community that we want? What is the society that we're fighting for? Do you think it's uh, driven um, basically on like emotion or maybe anger, and which is why sometimes it's hard to decide what to go towards exactly because we're maybe like bogged up by the anger that they're doing things towards communities. On my example, I'm Hispanic. Mm -hmm. So I have families, immigrants, and who are getting deported. And sometimes people riot and they're angry and it's hard to see, you know, through it all and decide, okay, what is exactly what we want? What justice, what is justice? Yeah, definitely. And thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, and so many you know, people in my family also who are undocumented and incarcerated and like the pain and the anguish and just the frustration and the anger and it's righteous anger and rage, you know, we can get stuck there. And in doing this work, there have been times where I'm just stuck and like, I'm angry. Um, and, you know, I'm down for a riot, but you know, after a riot, you know, things are just burnt up. And we have to like, okay, what are we going to build, you know, in this place? We burn this gas station down. All right. What are we going to build, right? What are we, <laughs> we going to put in place? We're going to replace it with. And it seems like we have a hard time getting there. And that's why I'm really excited about our Freedom Cities Initiative because it is moving us towards and that same level of energy and momentum needs to be put into what it is that we want to build up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, I just wanted to thank you guys for coming out here. And my question is specifically for Tia. Um, you mentioned in your talk today, trans people. Um, I was just curious because I, re I recently read that um, at least from 15, 2015 and 2016, there was a large um, assault and murder of trans black women. And I wanted to know if um, you have done like anything involving that and how me as like a cis person can help um, trans women of color. Yeah, so I'm um, learning about like LGBT issues and trans issues in general. Um, I'm right now, we're still in like a learning stage. And so what we've been doing is trying to build relationships. So I've been trying to build relationship with uh, specifically like black trans women activists, black trans immigrant folks, black trans undocumented immigrant folks um, to learn um, about what's going on with trans communities. There is a documentary that, um, Dream Hampton, she's a filmmaker, produced, I think it's called, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of it. Look up Dream Hampton, Detroit, and it's a documentary about a trans woman who was murdered in Detroit, and the story of like her family, her community. Um, and so the work that I'm doing, because I know that me, as a cis person, I'm not gonna be able to fight a fight for another community, but I can stand in solidarity and I can also do work with myself. Um, that's why I talk about like, you know, the bathroom issue. I can do work with myself and I can also build relationship and be in community with people um, who are directly impacted and take their leadership. And so that is what my advice is also around solidarity is to take the leadership of directly impacted people. So there are, um, are organizations like um, Get Equal, Trans Women of Color Collective, um, 
in other initiatives that are being led by black trans women, right? That need support, they need resources, they do um, different activities and actions and days where again, you know, if a black man is killed by police, you know, people get out in the streets all across the country, we gotta throw down. You know, black trans woman is murdered by someone in the community, right? And you can't even get the police to investigate. Um, and so what is it that we need to do in order to not only, again, like what does that, what are we saying about the value of that person's life? What also are we saying about um, within our communities that we find this to be acceptable, that we, you know, understand, you know, why there's violence against these communities? I think that the, um, like, kind of expected life expectancy rate of a black trans person is like the age of 25. So they're like ridiculously young. Um, and so that's the work that I'm doing now is in building relationships with the folks who are directly impacted and trying to follow their leadership. Um, and then also as a cis person talking about, um, you'll be amazed how effective it is to talk about issues that make people uncomfortable um, and you know, really confronting yourself and your biases, also people in your family and also your friends. Um, and really personally, my uh, uncle, my dad's, my sister's, no, no, my mom's brother growing up had a friend um, who transitioned from male to female. And I remember when it happened, I was, you know, like six years old. And I said, Mom, you know, uh, Angel is a girl now. And I tell the story all the time. My mom said, yeah, you know, Angel's a woman now. That's right. And she left it at that. So she didn't instill any fear in me. She would answer any question that I had about it. But I think like just the idea that, you know, allowing people to exist, not erasing them, not marginalizing them, not ostracizing them and not othering them, but just letting people be who they are, right? That is all that really anybody wants. Um, and that is the challenge that I think that we have, that we're faced with when it comes with, uh, uh, trans folks and gender non-conforming folks is that, you know, we don't even just let people just be, you know, we exact, we act like somebody's existence is an uh, inconvenience and a problem. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that question. Thank you for being, um, you know, willing to step up as an ally, right? It's really important. Any other comments? I want to say thank y'all. Yes, thank yeah. you very thank much for, all for coming out. Thank yeah. you. There'll be a table. Right. Let's give our both of our speakers a hand. So, Mr. Sankofa will have a table on this side um, as you exit right um, right outside of these doors. I want to again uh, thank both of you for being with us this evening. It has been our pleasure to host. Uh, thank you again to Dean Tweedio, President John. I think I um, saw a, a commission, there you go, Dr. Lowe, is that you? <laughs> There's my counterpart, I'm Dr. Lowe, she's Dr. Lowe also. But we really um, hope that um, you share your experience tonight with those who have not, were not able to attend and really kind of marinate on all of the information that you got. We had a really kind of a broad uh, program full of depth. And so I, I made a note to myself that I fed my soul tonight. And so I, <laughs> I felt like I walked in, I'm sure for many of you as well, it was, it was a long day and a long week, but today was exceptionally long. Um, but I really feel rejuvenated and revitalized. And in addition to um, those who were uh, listed on the program, what really made my heart sing and happy were the students. And so I, I am just so thankful that you all came tonight and uh, we hope to continue seeing you at events like this in the future. It has been our utmost pleasure. Thank you and please have a good and safe evening.